The streets won't lie to you. They don't have to stop any of this. They, they just left a long day at work, going home, they got wife and kids at home, whatever the case may be. The streets are the streets. So if people don't like you, they will keep walking or they'll, they'll tell you like, yo, you're trash. But some of them, they'll take a couple minutes like, no, amazing, thank you so much, like brighten up my day. And that, it means so much because it's so real. Creative labor as such didn't really come into existence until the advent of mass mediums like radio, film, and television. And it was right here, between 6th and 5th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, that a global empire of radio and later television entertainment grew alongside a new creative class at NBC's iconic headquarters at Rockefeller Center. The land for the complex was leased from Columbia University by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in 1929 as part of a plan led by another powerful New Yorker, Otto Kahn, to build a new home for the Metropolitan Opera. Clashes between Kahn and the real estate company that controlled the opera house resulted in its scuttling, with Rockefeller assuming the role of developer as well. The son of the legendary oil baron embarked on the multi-million dollar real estate endeavor just as the Great Depression started to take its toll across the country. The enormous project would provide a lifeline to the city's teetering economy and help restore the tycoon's public image. Tarnished since the tragic union-busting scandal at a Rockefeller-owned coal mine left 13 women and children dead. Roughly 5,000 working class people that lived in the area had to be evicted. Speakeasies and brothels on lots adjacent to Columbia's 12 acres were also acquired and demolished to carve out space for the master plan. The construction of Rockefeller Center was a watershed event that not only changed New York, but once completed, became more than a symbol of American power in the world over the next century. The vacillating Metropolitan Opera was jettisoned from the project by Rockefeller himself at the last minute, leaving a large vacancy that was quickly filled by the owners of a much more powerful kind of venue. The Radio Corporation of America finalized the lease to rent a million square feet of office space, just as it settled an antitrust lawsuit with the Justice Department. Thanks to the election of RCA progenitor Franklin Roosevelt, the terms of the deal were far less onerous, and the company was able to continue operating a de facto monopoly. The architectural design of what was briefly called Rockefeller City, after the original name of Metropolitan Square no longer made sense, became a battleground between stylistic anachronisms and the modernist aesthetic coming from Europe. The lead architectural firm's inclination for the latter would win out in the end, placing Rockefeller Center at the vanguard of 20th century architecture. This tug of war between old and new pervaded the art commissioning process.
prominent American artists like Lee Laurie, Leo Friedlander, and Paul Manship, who fashioned the famous gilded Prometheus in the lower plaza, were commissioned to execute many of the outdoor elements. At the Fifth Avenue entrance of 45 Rockefeller Center, known as the International Building, is an imposing cast bronze statue of Greek Titan Atlas, bearing an armillary sphere on its shoulders. In Greek mythology, Atlas and Prometheus are brothers who are punished for sharing knowledge with humanity. Both sculptures are linked together by zodiac rings which symbolize their allegorical responsibility for the fate of mankind. On the West 50th Street entrance, Laurie's Art Deco panel, Story of Mankind, depicts the god Mercury as a symbol of radio communication and the pinnacle of human progress, who lords above the four races, navigation, science, and industry. Down the street, the classical style bass reliefs flanking the entrance of NBC Studios by Leo Friedlander were designed with radio and television as underlying motifs. One commission in particular would foreshadow the struggle between the nascent creative class and the forces of capital intent on shaping artistic expression to further its own ends. Diego Rivera was at the height of his fame and infamy. Branded a class traitor by his leftist cohorts for accepting commissions from the likes of Edsel Ford and Rockefeller, Rivera was at a professional crossroads. His industrialist epic, aptly titled Man at the Crossroads, was to be unveiled at the grand opening of 30 Rockefeller Center on May 1, 1933, International Workers' Day. An odd date to inaugurate such a conspicuous monument to capitalism, but perfectly in keeping with the Rockefellers' ongoing PR efforts to mitigate working-class enmity since the Ludlow scandal. John D. Rockefeller's oldest grandson, Nelson, returned from his long honeymoon to oversee the commission himself. Rivera was a personal friend of Nelson and his mother Abby, who once quipped that owning communist-inspired artwork, like the May Day sketchbook she had purchased from the Mexican artist years earlier, might help spare her come the revolution. Despite the unequivocally Marxist rhetoric in Rivera's proposal and his widely known communist sympathies, no objections were raised during the approval process. It was only when the mural was all but finished, and three days past the deadline on May 4th, that Rockefeller wrote Rivera asking him to remove a portrait of Lenin he had improvised on the wall. Rivera was amenable at first, but encountered fierce opposition from his wife Frida Kahlo and his assistants, who threatened to strike if any changes were made. The ensuing controversy had a curious outcome for Rivera. Not only did he receive his full commission for a mural that never saw the light of day, but the very public confrontation restored his image in leftist circles. Nelson Rockefeller, for his part, displayed the political talent that would shape his future by lobbying to save Rivera's mural, even as he had covered it under tar paper and wood for nearly a year. eventually destroyed and replaced with Jose Maria Surt's American Progress. 
an outspoken supporter of Franco's fascist government and the aristocracy in general, Sert was the ideological opposite of Rivera. As Sert set up his scaffolding, one of Rivera's assistants, Ben Sean, embarked on a nationwide photography project to document the effects of the Great Depression, which was then reaching its most dire stages. Sean joined over a dozen photographers recruited by the Information Division of the Farm Security Administration, a New Deal agency to build popular support for federal spending programs through graphic depictions of America's poor. Brainchild of economist Roy Stryker, the FSA's project captured more than 250,000 images. The massive photographic archive exemplified the nascent propaganda wars being waged with new media technologies. As the depression worsened, millions of Americans turned to their radios and straight into the arms of on-air personalities like Father Coughlin. a Roman Catholic priest with a gift for oratory and a taste for fascism, whose Nazi-sponsored radio show attacked Roosevelt's New Deal policies and blamed minorities for the economy's woes. My dear friends, that among other things in the National Union for Social Justice, we are Christian in so far as we believe in Christ's principle of love your neighbor as yourself. And with that principle, I challenge every Jew in this nation to tell me that he does not believe in it. War and emerging media technologies like radio, film, and television produced an unprecedented demand for creative labor. Laborers to write the stories, sing the songs, and paint the pictures that Nelson Rockefeller himself would bankroll through the office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, a federal propaganda agency that funded countless magazines, films, and radio shows during the war, working with foreign intelligence agents who were by then crawling all over the 66-story limestone tower. Capital is at a disadvantage when it comes to the creative class, because unlike their factory-bound cohorts, artists own the raw materials of their craft, their imagination. Beyond the Rockefeller Center's property line, the street still offers a space where artists can steer clear of agendas and explore the world on their own terms. Who am I? I'm Jay La Soul, but even before that, I'm Joshua King. That, that, that's my real name. And I'm just a boy who grew up, like I said, in Queens, New York, Jamaica, Queens. And um, I was always like an artistic kid. I'm saying I didn't really care that much for school. I did great in it, but it wasn't my thing. And as I got older and older, I, was, I just, I didn't like how the world operated. And I wanted to do my own thing. I just wanted to live and be comfortable living. So eventually I found poetry and eventually that grew into music. And once that, once that happened, it was a process, but I felt at home. I felt like I could be free, I could be alive. As I made my way out of New York, I was venturing beyond that perimeter myself and starting my own creative journey, which like all journeys worth taking, never would have taken place if I had known what awaited me.
Thank you.